Welcome, welcome everybody. We still have people entering from the waiting room. Nice to see so many faces. Um, feel free to use the chat to write where you're hailing from, where you're tuning in from today. It's nice for us to get a sense of who all is out there. Um, my name is Julia Marianska, and I am one of the three filmmakers of the Village of Lovers, along with Ian McKenzie and John Wolfstone, and we're, we three are here today uh, offering our experience, our knowledge about uh, the topic of reconciling monogamy and polyamory, a third pathway for secure and liberated relationships. So honoring whatever it is that brought you here today to tune into these topics, we're excited to share what we know. And just so you all know, this Zoom is being recorded. <clears throat> it will live um, online as an evergreen video for all to view on our website. If you wish to not be depicted, you're welcome to go off video. Um, and we will have a chat open, which you are welcome to write your questions, your comments in throughout the webinar. And toward the end, we will have an opportunity to be a little bit more interactive um, and take your questions and be in a bit of dialogue. So yeah, noticing still people are entering. <laughs> I myself, I am tuning in from Northern California here on Southern Pomo and Miwok land, along with John, also in the same territory. And Ian is hailing from Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island, that's right. Couch and territory here. All right. And Ian, so, we wanna- Yeah, I could kick yeah. off the slideshow and we could, we could dive in yeah. and let people still trickle in. How's that sound? Yeah, that's great. Maybe I just invite everybody to take a deep breath and get comfortable wherever you are to just land your body, whatever got you here, whatever it took for you to take this time out of your day to be here. Thank you. And um, we look forward to hearing from you in the chat and in dialogue at the end. Awesome. I'm going to pull up the presentation now. Okay. Great. See that? Yeah, I think that I can just uh, take it and then we can dive in. I mean, just to say, welcome again, everybody. I'm John Wolfstone. I'm resisting the urge to uh, send hearts to each of the people that I uh, know. Just had a good joy kind of browsing through all the little uh, windows of uh, lovelies. Um, yeah, and this is a gift. You know, we did a webinar last week, and this is in some ways uh, part two. And we're just so grateful for the huge uh, response here because really this has been a 10 year arc for Ian, Julia and myself really around the most core questions of our personal lives and that we see, you know, at least for us that we're holding as a um, collective. So Ian, if you want to go to the next slide and I can share about where we're coming from. Okay, so we did this last time. We thought this was helpful just to name our premise. This is kind of the thesis statement um, that we are like working with. And again, we're really here not to say like this is the ultimate truth, but to propose a idea, a frame, and then we get to kind of feel through it and also learn with you. And that's kind of the arc of this entire project that we are really in of the past 10 like years. So that's part of our pre-frame to the frame. Um, and the premise is, is that beyond the binary of monogamy and polyamory, or really any identity structure, there is a larger relational ecosystem when, once tended, will reveal the nature of and care for the love relationships in our lives. I'm going to say that one more time. Beyond the binary of monogamy and polyamory, or any identity structure, there is a larger relational ecosystem when, once tended, will reveal the nature of and care for 
the love relationships in our lives. So we're going to spend the next like 45 minutes or so um, um, unpacking that because that's like a lot there. But even if you want to go to the next one, we can kind of mm -hmm. give you the arc. So this is the arc of how we're going to get into that. So we're going to talk about the why. Like, why are, why are we doing this? Why does this premise matter to like us? We're going to share some of our personal stories in that of how we came to this. We're going to name some definitions. So we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about where are we coming from based on cultural um, assumptions. We're going to talk about the same for like, what is the evolutionary biology that's brought us to this point? We're going to then talk about like, what is this ecosystem perspective on relationships? We're going to talk about what does it mean if we're really in that idea of a ecology and we all know the importance of soil to ecologies, like what does it really mean to build new soil? What does that mean to really be seeding fields of trust? Um, and then we're going to talk a bit at the end, you know, we're going to do that. We're going to enter a more freeform space. We're going to dialogue with like you, answer some questions, see what wants to emerge. Then at the end, we're going to talk about uh, a summer of love, uh, forbidden fruit cohort that we're holding space for this summer, as well as other opportunities just to stay engaged. You know, we had a book club yesterday. A few of us are reading Sex at Dawn. I saw some of those people here now. And there's a lot of ways we're just trying to create space for this global and very personal conversation to be uh, happening. Um, so with that, we can get into the why. Okay, the why. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, we think that it's important that, you know, in some ways, maybe you could say that each of these three levels, the personal, the systemic, and the political are like linked, um, or they are really all kind of nested within each other. And actually, Tamara, the subject of our film, has a line that's really been, I think, a core inquiry of ours, which is that the personal is also the political. And I'd say that for me personally, I came to this work about 10 years ago when actually I was spending a year in the Holy Land, in Palestine, in Israel, in Jordan. And I was really, you know, having my eyes opened as a Jewish American man to the apartheid um, that was happening there with Palestine. And actually, it was in that context of actually a Israeli Palestinian like peace house that I first learned about Tamara. And I actually got a book from Tamara at that time. And I eventually went on and joined this bicycling social circus and worked for a month in a refugee camp in North Jordan, which was during the Syrian civil war, um, where I was daily facing like the realities of war in a way I never had while reading about this place in Portugal, which we eventually made a film on, and just realizing that, wow, like war is so fucked up. And I was getting the chance to somatically feel that in a different way um, while also recognizing that, wow, like what are the ways I am in, what are the ways the system that I am coming from is a system of war, of domination, just by the way I eat or live or the houses I like live in. And what does it mean to actually try to deconstruct you know, and decolonize uh, and reconstruct a system of peace really from that core level of how I live and how I relate. And that's what really, this like how I love kind of sent me on this journey and led me to really Ian and Julia and into this whole wave of the past 10 years that has led us here. So that's kind of my personal inroad. I'll pass it to Ian who can pick up uh, his story next. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, for me, I've uh, essentially trying to, I've been on a thread the last 15, 20 years now, trying to track really the big question of what happened? Like, how did we get here? How did, how did we end up at the brink? And for me, that led me through a variety of threads, including um, the Occupy movement. I worked on a film with a Canadian director, Velcro Ripper. Um, the film became Occupy Love, which was looking at, you know, what was this impulse that um, seemed like the collective was having? Uh, and to serve the more beautiful world, which is also the time when I met Charles Eisenstein. And of course, we collaborated on a few other projects, including Sacred Economics, based on his book. Um, and throughout all of this as well, uh, Tamara reached out to me because they saw what I was doing with love, at least 
within these other activist domains. And they said, you know, you should come out here and see what we're doing with love, uh, some radical stuff. And uh, I thought, you know, interesting, but it was just one email amongst many. And uh, it wasn't until the end of my marriage, which largely happened through essentially navigating so many threads of this very conversation that we're holding today, which is how to, um, yeah, how to move through the tension point of this um, desire to be uh, more beyond the confines of, of what the dominant culture presents as within, you know, a typical default by monogamous marriage and the challenge of actually moving outside of those uh, domestic domains without the kinds of mutual support and solidarity needed in order for that to actually flourish. And so really in that heartbreak, I said, now it's time to go to Tamara, clearly have to learn a few things and uh, met John through this as well and ended up uh, launching the Kickstarter for the film. Uh, and we went to Tamara and my life was never the same. Uh, and a year after that initial journey, uh, we actually were woven into the uh, life or the life of Julia, who also was on a similar train with love and partnership and union and looking beyond the typical scripts that we have. And so maybe I'll pass it over to Julia to pick up the thread. Thanks, Ian. Whew, I noticed my heart beating fast. <laughs> um, yeah, my way into all of this as a little bit of background, I was born in Poland, uh, in Eastern Europe, and I was um, raised in a nuclear family with two parents and a sister. My parents have been monogamously married for nearly 50 years now. Um, I have a very early imprint of village life. Um, the house we had in Poland is part of a very uh, long-standing village. I have a memory of, um, at one summer, like the men from the village coming to work on our roof together with my dad to replace the roof. And um, yeah, there's just certain um, imprints of village life that felt very nostalgic to me when I first got to Tamara, which was the first time in 2016. My parents, as I mentioned, monogamously married. I remember as a teen, something in me um, feeling like that's not for me like not that that there's anything wrong with being married but that there I had some I didn't have words for it then but I told them I was going to have a lot of boyfriends and I didn't want to get married um and um in my early 20s began discovering my sexuality embraced myself as a bisexual being moved to California moved to an intentional community dove into um, practices around sexuality and started my path of examining um, and trying to dismantle some of the, I guess there's the colonized perspectives on my own body of what is it to be a woman who reclaims her orgasm or what is it to be a woman who dares to go for um, what I desire and that the fast track toward marriage and kids despite what I was brought up to want and conditioned um, to believe was the way, was not a straight line for me. Um, and so that brings me to some of the systemic pieces that have really bolstered my devotion to this work. Um, in the making of this film, The Village of Lovers, which took eight years, is just one of the expressions of my cultural research and personal research. Um, I've devoted myself to um, being a media maker who starts to reclaim aspects of, of sensuality and, and body empowerment. And when John already mentioned, um, these kinds of things are not easy to do, perhaps easier than many places when living in a place like San Francisco where it's a bit in the water and there's a lot of history of people coming to the Bay Area to live more sexually liberated lives and be more of who they are allowed to be than other places in the world. Um, but many of the dominant systems in the majority of the world rely on competition. There are any places that are driven by the capitalist system are certainly driven by, by conquest and competition and in that way, the systemic and the personal and the political are all entwined because we as human beings who are part of a modern culture, unless 
somebody is tuning in from a very intact culture where uh, that is not dependent on capitalist imperialist uh, pillars, I think that there's been an influence that has infiltrated personal relationships and lives. And that um, we'll get into some of that in the later, um, later presentation. But to think that there is actually, a, yeah, an underpinning um, in the dominant culture or, or what we would call the overculture where um, private property, where uh, domination are values that drive, drive and cohere the society that we live in. It is very difficult to break out of, um, break out of those values in our personal lives. And so being at Tamara is one of those places where we start to see that the personal becomes the political. And furthermore, for me as a woman who's coming from a lineage of women who did go on that linear track of uh, what some might call the relationship escalator of a, a quick, quick track toward marriage and children, um, recognizing that there is there is a piece of work here <clears throat> that there I wanted to open the door a bit more to recognizing what is it what is it possible in a society where female bodied people start to claim what they truly want also in sexuality and in love. And we don't just operate onto the, um, the dominant expectations. Um, and also recognizing that there are people across the world, for example, the kinds of actions that I might feel free to be in. So we're also talking here about, we'll be talking about what is liberation and what is security. That some of the behavior of being a, lib a sexually liberated woman in some parts of the world still today could be punishable by death. And for me, um, it is an act of activism. It is an act of, uh, of yeah, a political stance to say, I'm going to claim what's true and what is, um, what is also relational. We're gonna get into all of that a little bit more. It's not just an act of defiance, but being actually connected to what is the world situation and how, has, how have the politics of our world historically and uh, yeah, historically uh, colonized also women's bodies, but also male bodies and um, yeah, the spectrum there that that we ought to examine rather than going along in a default flow. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, we wanted to start off also by defining some of the terms that we're going to be examining today because there's a lot to look at here. Um, the word polyamory in and of itself in my observation and, and experience can be laden with, with a lot of assumptions and we'll get into assumptions as well. But something that we wanted to bring awareness to is that there's, there's actually a greater umbrella term of consensual or ethical non-monogamy. And the main point here is that all parties involved are consenting. That th there's not a domination game. It's not that one person wants to open the relationship and therefore the other one gets dragged along. That, that really, if we're looking at shifting paradigms um, from default monogamy, for example, and just to say this webinar is not prescriptive. It is not to try to convince anybody to live any particular kind of life way, but to really examine and start to illustrate the nuances. So as to look at, okay, we have monogamy here and there's lots of rainbow colors inside of how we can live monogamously, how we can live our love. And in the realms of polyamory, there's also a rainbow spectrum. And that can be from, it, that could be its own entire webinar. But to say, for example, there are people who are single or what you might call solo poly and relating to multiple relationships and multiple lovers where everybody knows about each other, but there's no primary relationship. On another part of that spectrum, there could be a primary relationship that maybe even includes a nesting partner or family with kids, with, which includes other lovers. Maybe those lovers are casual, 
maybe they're people who have primary uh, power, deciding power. There's such a wide spectrum. And if you're interested in learning about that, I highly, highly recommend um, the book Polysecure. If you haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a really good way to understand um, all those terms in between. Defining monogamy. Monogamy means being with one person romantically and sexually at a time. That means that there's no other romantic or sexual partners at the same time. Um, reconciling, right? So we, this, this webinar is not titled monogamy versus polyamory. We're not trying to keep them in opposition. To reconcile literally means to befriend, to bring closer. Um, to make agreement with. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make a bit more of understanding of this false binary. Um, secure, okay, so why are we talking about polyamory and, and monogamy leading to secure and liberated relationships? When we, I love the version of secure, we talked about it in our webinar last week, um, this, this definition of secure attachment as I feel safe when we're together and easy when we're apart. So I feel safe when we're together and easy when we're apart. Now, secure attachment, and if anybody here has gone deep into the definitions of attachment, there's a lot to learn. It is not a static state. Whatever our attachment figures were in early life, whether we had multiple attachment figures, our attachment to them could be different with each of them. Our sense of security and imprinting with those early attachment figures often translates into how we express in our closest romantic and sexual love relationships as adults. And that's really worth looking into. And it's also possible to heal if you have ever experienced insecure attachment from an early stage in your life. It is possible to earn secure attachment. And so we're going to be getting into that, not only from the point of view of a nuclear family setting, but also what does security actually mean um, on a wider scale, right? Not just in the binary relationship, but to look, how do we actually increase our points of connection and attachment within a web and an ecosystem so that we are more held? And that ironically leads to this case of liberation, right? So again, leading back to my own personal story, liberation is not about rebelling from the status quo and departing from um, a norm, but rather looking closely to see, is the cultural expectation actually the correct form for me to express my love? and when I express my love, how does that impact the ecosystem that I'm in? So looking at liberation as maybe liberation from isolation, maybe a departure from a dominant dominance over paradigm and liberation from constructs that might, might have been too narrow for our upbringing to then start to color in and illustrate the rainbow spectrum of possibilities so that Ultimately, and this is coming back to that political reason, is like at the core of all this work, there is a force of eros and love that throws through all beings. And how do we create the correct vessels for that energy to flow and not have it default into a channelized vessel that maybe a dominant overculture has prescribed? <clears throat> So maybe we continue yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I think this one's over to me. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. So continuing to lay out uh, the territory that uh, some most may be familiar with. And again, these are broad strokes to just help us with this conversation. Um, but this is the binary that uh, you might encounter as you try to navigate this terrain. Um, as I mentioned myself, I grew up with a monogamy by default uh, paradigm. I, I didn't know there's anything else. I never experienced or heard of or met anyone that, that was in a different relationship paradigm. 
And uh, there was a sense, of course, that 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 was the only true commitment, right? There was nothing else. It's just, it's that. And uh, eventually, you know, you would get there, ideally, if you wanted, if I wanted to partner, which I did. Um, I became married at 26. Uh, the whole relationship was 10 years. And um, it was through that relationship that I began um, encountering some of these other communities. Uh, I went to Burning Man, and everybody knows the best stories start with this one time at Burning Man. And uh, essentially, that was a way into um, encountering folks who yeah, who were participating differently. And it began to open my eyes a bit like, oh, this is possible. There's other ways to do things. And uh, my partnership at the time, you know, we began exploring some ways as consciously as best we could. But at the same time, traversing that territory is, um, again, it's not for the faint of heart. And it, it kind of requires a, a deep conscious willingness of both parties um, to be willing to navigate the territory. Otherwise, it can create a lot of tension and conflict in the relationship, uh, as it did for myself and my my wife. And ultimately, through the, those explorations, um, we ended up dissolving the marriage. And from that um, kind of being spat out of the monogamous container that we had or the sense of commitment that I that we had, I then flew or fled into the other direction. I uh, began dating someone who was more experienced in polyamory and spent five years very much in this, like this is this is the way, right? This is the this is the liberated path. Um, this is the more enlightened path. And uh, you know, I'm never going back to monogamy ever. Like that was very clearly a kind of stance I took. And I can see, of course, now that it did have some shades of uh, of a kind of yeah, you know, the hurt that I experienced within the closing of the previous relationship, and a kind of defiant stance that you know this is the way and not that. And um, this, as a setup in the culture at large, is somewhat recognizable. That you know, often hear people say, you know, who are monogamous would say, I never do polyamory uh, or non-monogamy. You know, that's gross. Sharing your partner with somebody else, uh, or that's not real commitment. That's just being a hedonist and and you know, uh, consuming sex like it doesn't matter. Um, and then polyamorous might say, you know, but this is the more enlightened path. You know, this is stepping out of the cage. This is true freedom. You know, um, I feel sorry for you noobs, you know, that are still in the default, in the default world, you know, with your monogamy, you know, so quaint. Um, and again, I'm deliberately characterizing these paths and there's lots of variations in between. So it's important, I think, to look a bit at the train and to understand, you know, the, the existing kind of tension between them uh, before we go a bit deeper. And so here's some more of the assumptions that uh, are often made. So the monogamy is more secure because again, you have one other person and, you know, they're your person and there's a commitment there. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's the only true real way to do things. Uh, there's less processing because, you know, you're not introducing all sorts of other dynamics within the relationship, um, more stability because, you know, simple one other person, uh, more, more boring. I didn't write these slides by the way, uh, <laughs> more, more boring in the sense of, uh, you know, typically it's known, right. That after a while in a, in a kind of conventional, monogamous relationship, the the attraction and the arrows can kind of dry up and, you know, you're, you're suddenly brushing your teeth side by side in a bathroom and, you know, wondering if it's business time or not. Uh, that's kind of the where it often goes. <laughs> and then, uh, but at the same time, right, there's this willingness to concede that, okay, but this is what true devotion is, you know, staying with that one person, no matter what. And, you know, again, we celebrate that often. Uh, still, we see an older couple in their 50s, 60s, they've been together 20, 30, 40 years, you know, that's like, uh, that's high achievement, you know, and interestingly, generally that gets um, put on them, regardless of the quality of the relationship, but just the fact they stayed together is often, you know, that's, wow, amazing, you know, good for them. Uh, but a lot of people stay in relationships, of course, when they shouldn't, uh, for lots of reasons that we might touch on later. And then polyamory, right, is assumed perhaps to be less secure, because you're introducing all these other dynamics, um, attractions, uh, you know, possibilities, uh, therefore introduces more processing, which I think is generally true in that you are inviting in having to navigate more nervous systems, uh, more dynamics. And so you typically want to be aware that this is what you're choosing. You're choosing to actually uh, willingly, hopefully participate in that kind of thing. Uh, there's less stability. I mean, there's very, there's countless um, stories that I hear of relationships that, uh, you know, opened their relationship and ended up quote, falling apart after. And oftentimes that's seen as a failure. Uh, polyamory is a failure, you know, because of that. And it's just an interesting dynamic to uphold the idea that because a relationship ended, it meant that the container was a failure. 
when we look at monogamous partnerships, of course, lots, maybe most of them eventually end, uh, or marriages, I believe the divorce rate is maybe close to 50%, something like that. So it's a bit of an unfair comparison even to say that one, uh, because it ended, is somehow a failure. But generally, that's the projection it gets. Uh, but polyamory is seen as more fun, perhaps. Um, I'm going to say a joke. I'm going to make sure I get the joke right. But it's something like, how many polyamorous does it take to screw in a light bulb? Right? Something like that. And joke goes, well, uh, <laughs> nobody really gets around to screwing because they're too busy talking about it. So <laughs> there's something in the sense that the the idea that polyamorous are just, you know, having con continual orgies all the time too, tends to be maybe more of a projection of the monogamous folk who might be thinking, well, wow, they must be having a lot more fun over there than over here. Um, but generally, yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and then, of course, the negative projection is that it's just frivolous. It's, you know, you meet somebody at a cacao ceremony and, you know, away you go. Uh, there's this this kind of uh, projection that, again, it's 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 not that deep, uh, it's shallow, and ultimately not really uh, requiring much in order to, to uh, participate in. So that's a bit of a flyby of some of the assumptions that we've uh, typically will come across. Okay, so... Now we're offering now a different frame. So rather than seeing monogamy and polyamory as in opposition and that there's only a horizontal line between the two, that it's either, you know, you're kind of in camp polyamory and you're in camp monogamy. We're trying to introduce now a different uh, idea the, that there's something in the synthesis between these two positions that in fact can invite a sense of understanding more of the bigger picture. And this is what we're going to spend the next uh, chunk of time exploring here. I believe this is over to John now. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And I didn't realize you were so funny, Ian. I was just cracking up over here. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, this is rich. And I think that, you know, also to say just that a lot of those assumptions that we have really around being human at some core level, but certainly on how we relate comes from... Um, you know, the last hundred years of like biological anthropological research where, you know, it's kind of common knowledge that chimpanzees are our closest relative. Like that was the cultural, uh, the cultural mimetic that I swam in growing up. And, you know, there's been brilliant research. Hey, thank you, Jane, Dr. Jane uh, Goodall for brilliant like research. also shared just so much of the beauty of uh, chimpanzees. And when we come into the realm of relating and sexuality, I think how the understanding that chimpanzees were our closest uh, relatives, our closest animal relatives, um, and why maybe that created a certain cultural view around promiscuity is because that chimpanzees have for better or worse, a fairly violent kind of patriarchal culture of sexuality where there are non-monogamous uh, relationships, but it happens in a pretty violent way and a way that isn't, yeah, it isn't the most uh, consensual, especially for female chimps, which is also something that just, there's, there is a lot of competition we've seen in the like animal world. And there's also lots of different stories, but focusing here on apes, and great apes, it was actually only in the last 30, 40 years that there was this revolution of essentially like anthropologists and scientists discovering, but of course they already existed. And of course the indigenous peoples in these areas knew this other great ape that is genetically as close to human beings and in many ways, socially in their behavior much closer, which is the bonobos. Um, and the reason this is important is because, again, coming from a place where we've thought of, we only really learned, like knew about chimps 50, 60 years ago, thought, therefore, this is how humans evolved from this place. And then lo and behold, this whole other species, the bonobos, which are genetically as close to us as chimpanzees, but actually share way more in common with us as far as like relationships and sexuality and bonobos have a completely different um and much more um egalitarian sexual and relational practices and culture than chimpanzees and just to name a few of the things that are 
true for bonobos that are similar to us is first that like females copulate or have sex during all phases of their cycle where chimpanzees only have sex during like menses during like ovulation time or during the, the ovulation time to get pregnant and also chimpanzees don't have sex when they're pregnant or lactating and bonobos have sex throughout all that that bonobos have a variety including uh male female male male female 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 male uh homosexual um and that chimpanzees really don't and that also that maybe the most profound thing is that bonobos use sexuality as a like for social purposes for bonding for tension reduction for conflict resolution for entertainment and that the and that that like tracking that in bonobos mirrors so similar to humans the only other ape that uses sexuality for just not being primarily a reproductive function and that in that sense the research kind of went towards is there something about how bonobos have this much more um much more egalitarian uh society coming from their own like group tribal uh uh, culture that is there a link between the way they share sexuality and the way that females in their culture have much more I'd say consent and empowerment versus chimpanzees which have much more of like a violent sexual culture and how that possibly can change the narrative of where like biological human prehistory comes from and that it because there's a lot of the chimpanzee narrative that means like oh we evolved to be monogamous, because that actually is more evolved than having multiple sexual relationships, which just ends in chaos and violence. But now, okay, we actually have another biological route to look at that actually there is a difference where there's another example where more open sexuality actually has really created much more of like a peace culture. And that also is part of the roots of what it is to be human. So we wanted to share that because that's part of us weaving in here. Like, what is this third way that might be reconciling both more closed and open ways of being sexual and romantic with our partners? Hmm. Thanks, John. One last piece on that as well. For those that are very curious about this at more length, uh, the book Sex at Dawn, like uh, Christopher Ryan and his co-author there, John has it. Yeah, it's an excellent resource for that. And um there's also uh, two interviews actually between Christopher Ryan and I, where we go into more details, which you can, we can follow up on that. Uh, but he goes, they go into it at quite at length. So I believe this is over to me now. Yeah, John. Yep. Okay. So again, why does this make, or why does this matter in this conversation, especially because on the one hand, um, what we've tried to say is that we have a system where there's a, almost like a kind of moral standpoint that has um, come in under, you know, quote, what relational paradigm are you and that you choose? And what does that mean about you, right, from a moral standpoint? In the history of monogamy as well, like, uh, my understanding is that the Christian church, of course, had a big hand in um, kind of enforcing monogamy as the default on the pagan tribes that had actually had much more, again, of an egalitarian uh, approach to relationships and sex. But at, at the same time, this is the systems, these are the systems we're in now. And so it's important then to begin to wonder and to sort of decouple the, any kind of moral standpoint between these positions and to say, okay, well, if you live in a system as most do in this, uh, in the dominant society, which is uh, often within these nuclear units that are themselves often devoid of real uh, embedment and, and committed uh, mutual support, uh, all of these structures that make up the, the rest of the story, we might say, i.e., true community, then it actually makes a lot of sense to be monogamous within this system. Uh, especially, for example, women where they have a certain uh, reliance, often maybe a bit less so these days because of uh, the feminist movement, things like that. But certainly in the past, uh, a woman, unmarried woman in the culture at large would have a lot of disadvantage, right, within uh, the dominant structures that support uh, men and the acquisition of wealth uh, that go to men. And so again, these kinds of um, organizing oneself around monogamy within this nuclear units within this wider structure make a lot of sense. And so that's why it's not to demonize or to judge um, folks that choose to be in these uh, uh, paradigms, but 
but to say that they are actually deeply relevant, they are adaptive to the needs of the structures that we find ourselves in. Um, just as ethical non-monogamy, as it's often practiced within the dominant cultural systems that we have, is actually inviting in a lot of the term often is polyagony, which is uh, because we don't have those structures, often people don't have those structures of committed support uh, and solidarity and a kind of commitment to the process of what can come up and often does in opening up big energies around you know sexuality, attraction, connection. Um, everything can come forth from that um, competition, again, jealousy, all this stuff that can uh, is is so much a part of it. If you don't have the structures in place to support that, uh, actually, it is inviting in a lot of difficulty uh, that can be often and is too much for relationships to hold, and hence often end up falling apart. And I should say, the consequence there often is to children. And again, I don't want to make a moral judgment on. Often, monogamous folks might say, "But think of the children, you know, for polyamorous, and you know, they're clearly um, kind of infecting children with a, a hedonistic lifestyle. This kind of stuff. It's not that. It's just that oftentimes, when you do invite in these big energies without the structures of support, it can create a lot of tension and conflict within a family system that the kids are the recipients of. Um, if the parents don't have the support they need, and the other places in which to process what comes up." Again, so this is what the challenge of being in a hybrid moment, which is a lot of people are living in these nuclear structural units and um, want to navigate outside of them, but then don't actually have the supportive structures in place to do so well. Um, and that's just often what we find ourselves. So we, uh, as we invite this releasing of the idea of an identity structure and look at them more as a term of practice, right? So uh, one way to think about it is, you know, rather than saying I'm I'm monogamous, right, or I'm I'm polyamorous, um, which I you know I fall into in both camps again uh, in the past, and rather than invite it as a practice, right, we are practicing monogamy, you know, at this time for these reasons, we are practicing polyamory at these times, you know, for these reasons, and that invites in again a kind of experimental um, and and kind of conscious navigation within these spaces without falling into any particular ideology about one being better than the other, but that they do have real consequence uh, no matter what path you choose. So that's the beginning of our um, entry now into this ecosystem perspective, but I'm going to drop it over to John. I think it's Julia. John or Julia to, Julia, Julia. Yeah, to unpack here the rest of this bit. Okay. Since the last time I spoke, I started having a coughing fit. So hopefully I'll get through this okay. Um, okay, thank you for that. I wanted to, um, yeah, take this a little deeper to acknowledge what is an ecosystem? Obviously in ecology, we understand that if you're trying to grow plants, it really is not just about any single element it's a combination of is there enough light is the soil fertile is there enough water is the soil rich what kind of nutrients are in the soil <clears throat> and what we want to emphasize is that this is not any different for relationships and so in a binary structure if we're thinking okay there's love there's lust there's two people coming together it just simply isn't enough for withstanding love relationships and then you add kids to the mix, a whole host of other needs are needed for an ecosystem to be strong. So if there's any other parents out there, I personally have a five-year-old, you know this very well firsthand. <clears throat> Understanding that, well, like what Ian was saying, that <clears throat> both monogamy and polyamory in the current systems in the dominant culture will struggle because we are in a bridge moment I feel that there is perhaps a wider cultural tide, whereas shedding more light on the spectrum possibilities of relationships transcending default monogamous structures. We're seeing that being reflected in mass media. I don't know about you guys, but I've been getting notifications about <clears throat> articles in the New York Times about 20 person polycules. Maybe some of you have seen the documentary called Monogamish the publication of books like Polysecure and Polywise and others that have been named here. Um, Sex at Dawn came out, I published well over 10 years ago. There is a, a something in the zeitgeist that is wanting us to look at 
opening the umbrella of relational possibilities. And what we're wanting to do is really look at what's in the soil, because what's in the soil makes possible what can grow. <laughs> now, what's in the soil of a of an overculture that is driven by capitalist values and imperialist extractive practices. Uh, we talked about this more in depth in our last week's webinar. There is an arrow that's being pointed toward individual happiness, <clears throat> toward security as kind of me and mine. How do I have my full bank account? How do I have my person? How do I have <clears throat> my security system that nobody bothers me or knows what my business is? Excuse me. And that breeds a culture of, uh, of promoting personal choice and individualism. And if we're working on that level, there's a limited view into the possibility of considering interdependence. Something I think I mentioned this last week is why well, I just love it so much. I think Stephen Jenkinson talks about um, the resistance that so many feel to actually leaning to be indebted to one another. What does it mean to be indebted to one another on the level of I'm doing this for you, you're doing this for me? We're transcending the transactional culture and stepping into relationality. So these are some of the old goals I think we're saying, but maybe that's even a little bit of a premature statement because they really are current. They are what drive current systems that many of us are living inside of today. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the factors that are influencing what we even want? <clears throat> so to consider, for example, if you're somebody who has identified as being a serial monogamist, is it simply because this is the only way you find that you can continue your explorations of love? Maybe the structures cannot hold something that is a little bit more complex. I'm not knocking it. I'm just asking, how do we decide what influences our decisions? <clears throat> you know, in the next moment, we're going to get into. Um, the ecosystem, the third way that we've been pointing at this whole time. But I wanted to really emphasize that without the, um, without leaning into the interdependence and the complexity that, uh, that makes a soil more fertile, <clears throat> we're left with what we have. And as we're seeing, also just one more thing about kids, cause it's, yeah, being a mom, it's top of mind. It's not just that polyamory could be potentially damaging to children. What's most beneficial, I think probably for all humans, but especially children, is to experience an intactness in love. And so whatever the form is, whether you have multiple partners or a single partner, if the children are witnessing breakdown, violence, transgression, and that starts to go into their imprint of love, it doesn't matter, that can happen and most commonly does in monogamous relationships. So let's break that binary of thinking that one would be more damaging than the other and to consider, yeah, how do we start to look at it from an ecosystem perspective as not only do the two adults have what they need, but does the child get what they need if the parents are trying to grow something out of a nutrient deficient soil? Mm -hmm. John, yeah. over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah. I'm just feeling so much love right now for both Julia and Ian. This is beautiful for me to just experience the ecosystem we've uh, created here. Um, and in that, you know, I think that in this third way, which is what we're saying is the way of the ecosystem, which is in a social field community. And we're also talking about the community of all life, also extending into the actual ecologies that we live in and that we're actually not separate from that. Um, but I think that what is so Im important kind of building on what Julia was saying is that in this false binary of monogamy versus polyamory, it's often like, well, what is going to make me more happy? 
right? That's, that's the focus. The view is like me and my own happiness and how can I maximize essentially my freedom of personal choice and what I want. And I think that the synthesis, this third way, isn't like take a little bit of a monogamy and a little bit of like poly and you're like uh, monogamish. And that's actually, no, it's, it isn't about uh, equalized between those. It's actually that a third way is a dimensional shift. It's like going from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional view. Another way to say that is there's this quote we were talking about earlier as we were uh, preparing for this, which is that it's no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a sick society. Or as Buck Mr. Fuller said, that you know the solutions that we need are not going to come from the same thinking that the problems were created on. We need to actually change the perspective that we have. So I think this question here is like, where does security and liberation actually come from? And I'd say that at the end of the day, if you think about secure attachment, like even if you find secure attachment with that one person, there's always this measure of the regenerative power of death in ecologies in this like universe. And that at some level, it's always going to be insecure if you're putting your personal, if you're putting your, your, your life aim just solely squarely on happiness or one other like person, or even on your own personal liberation. So I think what we're trying to say is that is if you start to actually step out and examine, wait, what is the social ecosystem I am in? And how do I tend that social ecosystem? And is there trust? And we're going to come back to this idea of trust a lot, because we'll say that actually trust in the ecosystem metaphor is the soil. So then the day, whether you are practicing monogamy or polyamory or anything in anything uh, in between, it's really about it coming from a wider relational soil of trust. And that's what is going to be ultimately also liberatory. Another way to say that is that you know your liberation is infused and dependent on the liberation of all beings. So it, you can't just go and maximize your personal happiness without the sense of having a wider community, which is eventually you can scale out the planet Earth. And what is the actual social ecosystems that are holding us in our lives? And I don't care who you are right now. You have some version of that, but we're not trained to be thinking about that, tracking that and making choices or around like, wow, what's going to be good for this ecosystem of my friendship group, of my parents' circle, of the like, of my child's friends, looking at things from this like level can start to create feedback loops that actually inform. And we'll talk about in this next slide, like, how do we actually consciously create this social ecosystem in a way that increases feedback loops, that, in, in, that increases trust, that increases the capacity for truth? to flow. But in that sense, like even to look at it and track it from that lens is actually where we're going to find security and liberation. And the last thing I'll say on, on, on a liberation, Ian spoke to it earlier, is that what if liberation isn't just the most freedom? What if liberation is really having the conditions to become what you were meant to be? The same way that if I have a seed, true liberation for a seed is all the right conditions in the ecosystem for it to fully grow into that tree or that corn stalk or that whatever. But it's having those conditions and oppressions are like limiting those conditions. So you can't fully grow. So that sense is not about what you want. It's really this more soul oriented of like, well, what is this meant to become? What is this relationship meant to become? For me, Ian and Julia, this film was like part of what the world was wanting from us. And we had to keep tending the ecology for it to happen more than it being like, oh, what do we each want? And what we want is part of it. But it's like one part of this bigger weave. We're actually, I think what we're finding, what we've seen at Tamara is that when you actually weave yourself into the social ecosystem, there is a sense of belonging and attachment and happiness that goes far beyond anything that would have been possible had we just fully been able to maximize what we personally wanted. Um, so with that, I'll pass it, I think, back over 
to Julia for talking about kind of how this flows in an ecosystem. <laughs> Literally. Um, thanks, John. Yeah, I love that, um, that visual of the seed becoming what it's meant to become. And in that sense, um, one of the beautiful teachings that I, that I carry from being in Tamara <clears throat> is this metaphor of water and love. Um, I love that we have a picture of it here on the slide as well. Um, you could think about the energy of Eros, Eros being not sexuality explicitly, but the innate life force energy that, that goes through all beings, right? Not just human beings, but it's the energy that comes through a blooming flower, a bursting tree, a child who is growing. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there is something about all of that, which needs vessels, it needs the correct vessels to flow. And like water, if we watch the ways that rivers take their course, it's not natural for a river to move in a straight, linear, channelized way. A river is meandering. <clears throat> At times, it's a mere trickle in a, in a stream that could be quite shallow that you can wade through. At times it's raging. At times there's huge force that comes with a waterfall. If you've ever been at a dam <clears throat> or seen a dam break, you know the energy and the pressure that can be caused when that energy of the river is attempted to be held back. It's why um, humans have harnessed hydropower and there are limitations to that. There are limitations to ecosystems when we think about, for example, the natural course of salmon who rely on rivers to be fully clear and intact to swim upstream. <clears throat> Life cycles are broken when pathways are dammed or they are not able to be channelized in the correct ways. And so that comes again to this third pathway to thinking about what are the correct vessels for these really big life energies of love and arrows and sexuality? And um, yeah, we came to this saying, love is water and water is life. Obviously water is life. It's a big slogan. We've been with it for years <clears throat> in, the greater, in the greater and indigenous movements to protect water. And it's all connected. Water is giving us life. Love is a is like the life force that moves through the earth, and so it's metaphorical, it's literal. Um, and what we want to bring awareness to are what are the vessels that are needed for our love to flow, um, <clears throat> and what are the ecosystems that are needed. So taking it out of the theoretical and into the practical, it's like. I, for me personally, I've been practicing non-monogamy for 14 years. I'm in an open marriage and I have a five-year-old child. And I also have in my life a very committed group. It's um, just five of us. We meet regularly um, with dear friends to go into a, an embedded sharing circle where we get to reveal ourselves, we get to be reflected by one another, and we get to say things that might be difficult outside, inside of just the small dyadic format. For me and my partner, sometimes there's a rub and it requires a larger vessel so that big energies don't erupt. I mean, sometimes this can also be helpful if relationships, people in relationships are working with therapists or counselors, and there's a possibility of creating the vessels in our social structures as well that help to support the sharing of the big energies. <clears throat> in my group, there is another couple and a single person, and there are erotic energies that are being explored. And sometimes it's really helpful for those in the, in the triad to have the support of us who are outside of it to reflect back and invite deeper sharing, what the others may not necessarily have the courage to ask for and hold on their own. 
And so I share this personal story just as an example of um, that wasn't a workshop, that wasn't um, somebody that I had to pay, but it's based on a building of years of mutual trust and mutual support that we decided to co-create a committed uh, group um, and use that vessel to hold some of the bigger energies that are flowing through our lives. And we don't only focus on issues of love and sexuality, but also the bigger issues of our lives because we are multidimensional human beings. Four of us in the group are also parents. We grapple with life's questions and it's a really supportive container to have, to know that there are other human beings that have uh, our back. <clears throat> so, and, yeah. and I just want to weave a point here as we go to the next slide, which I tell is going to be you, Julia, just that in this idea of love being water and that water flowing through an ecosystem where you think a river going from maybe a like spring top of a, a, a mountain on its journey down to an ocean, that it changes form based on the needs of the ecosystem. And I think we're trying to say in this whole webinar at some levels that if we tend a if we tend a ecosystem, us personally and maybe our love partnerships, even our lifelong love partnerships, will have the nutrient rich soil and the healthy ecosystem to continually be the form that it needs to be for the moment it is in. And that what we've actually tracked is that relationships change form and have different needs at different times. And instead of having to settle on, I am this, we are uh, monogamous or polyamorous and getting kind of stagnant or thinking that that is more evolved, can we actually create a holistic system that we can continually be in tune with, with those groups that are holding us, which have many nested layers. We're also part of a much wider 30, 40 person like community network here that has different meetings, different times, different circles. But can we really embed in an ecosystem where that we don't have to position our truth based on identity, but we can actually live our truth and be responsive to it again and again and again, because that's what allows the water to fully nourish the soil when it's allowed to flow in those ways, giving the most life to our lives and the ecology that it's in. John, can I have a point there? Yeah. 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 Just one point I want to make too on the water metaphor is, um, uh, so there's a fellow Jack Zimmerman, who's a elder in relationship. He wrote, co-wrote the book, The Way of Counsel with Gigi Coyle. Um, he also wrote a book called Flesh and Spirit, which is about applying counsel practice to uh, partnership. But in uh, my interview with him, he spoke about a beautiful metaphor that aligns with this, which is that he, in his own experience, being a counselor really for monogamous partnerships, for polyamorous partnerships, he just attuned to a sense that, um, and this isn't true across the board in the sense that it's dynamic and changing, but that um, polyamorous uh, partnerships in the way love moves like water is similar to the ecosystem of a wetland that it kind of nourishes uh, throughout a, a wider area. And in, in that sense, yes, can can support a sort of, yeah, moving of soil and nutrients to a wider uh, mass of distance. Whereas uh, monogamous relationships, or at least moments of monogamy, you could say, um, are like water moving through a canyon, like a, through a narrow canyon that can bring a lot more energy and focused um, intensity, but that that could be also very beautiful and necessary at different times. And so I just wanted to add that as well from uh, a metaphor on water and arrows and movement and what paradigms may be valuable for each moment. Yeah, and I'll just add one last piece because you reminded me, John, is that as our river of life flows, our needs, our desires shift throughout life. We go through seasons. So what I desired um, as a maiden was very different from when right after I gave birth and my relationship container adjusted to honor the different needs and priorities. And um, I think that there's yeah a need to understand again, we're so beyond this linear path that there has to be a sense of adaptation to the fluidity of this life energies. And that leads me to, you know, as we're looking now, <clears throat> getting close to the end here, and we'll open it up for questions. But before that, we want to just, yeah, emphasize not figuring it out alone. So thank you for coming here. Thank you for being in this virtual group space here where we're figuring it out together. Um, something that we love 
as a teaching from Tamara <clears throat> is the idea of contact. So um, where I live in Northern California, there's a lot of talk about consent. And so we also talked about consensual non-monogamy where everybody is agreeing. And contact takes it a little deeper, I find, which is that we actually engage um, the felt sense, the, uh, the intuitive powers that we have to empathize with each other as human beings. So it's not to erase the verbal consent that is often needed. For example, if you approach and you want to touch somebody, but you actually, you actually expand your bubble of awareness to understand what are the energies at play here? What is the possibility to move towards contact? What kind of contact feels true? And to not presume based on previous agreements that just because something, uh, maybe a more intimate contact has happened in the past, that it will occur again, or that there's any kind of um, entitlement to to furthering and deepening, but really being in the present, in the truth of what is with, between two people. <clears throat> of course, um, if we think about Um, if we think about, okay, these next points, a relationship beyond personal preference. We talked about it before. Moving out of individualism and towards something that has the possibility to, um, yeah, to be an interdependent choice from being rooted in an ecosystem, um, from being impacted by the, the possibility that there are other options um, and that we're not just going and also other needs in the ecosystem. So we're not moving toward just our individual preferences and kind of bulldozing everything that's in the way and wreaking havoc, but understanding I inherently as a being am impacting the surroundings. And how do I do that in a self-responsible way? How do I show up in an ethical way that considers my impact on the whole? <laughs> well, and just and just to also add to that point i think a relationship also founded in like beyond personal preference also founded in a vision which we talked at the end but like what is it to have a relationship that also is founded on not just the personal preference of two people but also a path of service whether that is raising children but many people like we came together for the service of this film and this dialogue and what is it to be even orienting of like relationships coming together because there's something to like do and really honoring what that is and letting the feedback loop from the culture help inform and feed it being just more than just my happiness and your happiness that's bringing our potential happiness that's bringing us together can i make one point too around this which is just as an interesting thought experiment is um especially with a lot of literature now and the perspective that you know, an Instagram influencers and relationship coaches and everything is that typically you're going to choose for your partnerships or relationships um, based on your unconscious and unresolved childhood wounds, right? That's kind of like the baseline now that's out there, which is uh, somewhat of a, uh, a thin uh, way of understanding relationship. But generally that's there, which basically means you're not actually the best person to figure out who's the right fit for you in terms of what may bring the most um, mutual uh, nourishment to the soil of, of a partnership and to the soil of community. And yet at the same time, in the West, of course, we've really enshrined this idea of personal choice. And if you want to have the relationship, like that's it, that's all that's actually required. Or even to have children, right? That's the other thing that was quite significantly different at Tamara was that when a couple comes together and they wanna have a children, they have to like bring that to the community because they know that having a child within the community ecosystem is going to have impact. Uh, and so again, this is, um, we get, we have maybe shades of other cultures that have arranged marriages, right? And so in the West, it's like, hell no, we don't want that. That sounds so awful to be, you know, quote, put with someone uh, not of your own choice as we also enshrine romantic love. But I just wanna say there's this um, recognition that let's say you had a practice group of people that are all in mutual solidarity with you and your dynamics as well as theirs and that they can actually give you feedback on different relation, relational possibilities that can actually be more trustworthy, 
than your own personal preferences or your own passionate, lustful desire, right? For others that may end up just inviting you into the same wounded patterns over and over again. So again, these are different ways in which we can rely upon the community intelligence. Again, if they have their best interests at heart, right? Which um, ideally they do. And, you know, as a closing comment before we open it up for questions and please consider if you have a question, write it into the chat or if you feel comfortable, we can also unmute you and you can raise your hand and we'll bring you on screen to dialogue. But just this last bullet point here of common vision, um, such an important one, right? So in, in the dominant culture, there is a haste within which we claim partnership with a lover. Sometimes there's the energy of lust and there is a passion and quickly there's a claiming of partnership before there's time to really, to really explore do we share a common vision? Are we walking a common path? And, it, and if and when we do identify that common path, then our relationship becomes a service toward a greater good. Maybe that greater good is raising children. Maybe there's a common artistic endeavor. Maybe there's political work to be done. Maybe it's about tending land. It, it can be so many things. But to notice the haste to claim that kind of... Uh, of ownership, security, whatever it whatever it may be, that 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 there's that it's just so delicious. You you need to have it. And are we taking enough time to recognize with lovers, with with romantic partners, um, are we on a common path? Because often conflict arises later down the road within the in the um, we're in the crosshairs of wanting different things. And now if we start to think about expanding our ecosystems and including other people in our close circles. And, and I don't even mean in terms of sharing sexual intimacy, but also um, worldview. For example, the, the little pod that I mentioned I have earlier really is born of sharing a common worldview is that we have a way that we're looking toward our orientation together in the world. And of course we have our nuanced differences, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an essential commonality for how we're orienting toward what Tamara would call love free of fear. And so we can remind one another of coming back to that. And so for anyone out there who's maybe considering, I'd like to build my ecosystem. How can you orient with others who share a common vision and want to share a common path because there's then it's not a it's not a one against the other kind of an energy but rather that that triangle energy that we had before where there's two toward great or or more towards something greater so i'm seeing some um questions here one from queen b if yeah and, to... and yeah. just but... and just as we uh tra transition julie i want to say one thing and then we can open it up yeah go for it you know, hear you too. Just, just say that this one, um, you know, we're really setting forth like a perspective and this webinar, we don't have time to tell you all the how, which not that we fully know, but that, uh, we have really built towards this online course that was going to be a live cohort going through. That's going to go for 10 weeks to us in a group explore, and I feel like, yeah, just talk about this now, but then to really just open it up, just that there's so much how around how do we create systems of trust? How do we build transparency? How do we build feedback loops? And ultimately what I'm seeing, what I'm learning today is really around intimacy. How do we actually build the intimacy from having feedback loops, from having spaces of truth that flows and having that capacity to not be alone and even figuring any of it out? Because that's such the crisis of like loneliness right the, the like stress of life is having to go out it often alone no matter what the burden is and it, the joy i found and seen again and again is in that togetherness even if it's in a time of like abject like struggle it's that togetherness but that togetherness re requires an actual intimacy and i think monogamy or polyamory i've seen people in both camps absolutely starving for intimacy. So I think it's really this question of how do we really create intimacy through these feedback loops? And we're gonna have this whole 10 weeks together this summer to really break that down 
really move slow because there's so much here. It is a whole like cultural orientation and deconstruction, reconstruction. <laughs> it really is, I'd say, like a cultural rite of passage that we're going to be going through as a cohort. So I want to invite you all to that. We will have more info on our site. Maybe we can drop in a, a link. But um, we are just so excited to be able to have that time to develop uh, intimacy with a core group that wants to really travel and learn together through this time. And Ian, is there anything you want to say? And then, yeah, we can jump into questions. Yeah, I just wanted to orient the time that we do have, which is actually quite limited, down to 12 minutes. We wanted to give a bit more time for questions, but um, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll bring on Queen Bee in a second to ask your question. Uh, and then we may get to a few, but that we do have actually an online school, uh, which is skool.com platform, Reculture Education, where you can go in actually and be, ask these questions and, you know, really work with them. So just wanted to know in case there was any, you know, rush to, to get something in before the end of the webinar. And this is really the start of this conversation as well. So there's also that as a retention space. So let's see what we got time for, a few here. And uh, I'm gonna unmute uh, Queen Bee and you could uh, please go ahead and ask your question if, uh, there we go. Yeah, hi. So uh, great presentation. I love you guys' series so far. I did the summit after the movie came out and then the one from last week and it's very stimulating. Mm. Uh, so. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the question I have comes from uh, a theme that I have heard from you guys and also from Tamara, which is this theme of community and like uh, this sense of feedback from community, specifically feedback. Uh, I grew up in West Africa, Nigeria. I am queer, I'm a woman. Uh, I live in the US now uh, and I found that I have not lived in a society where I feel like leadership or even like the common view of mainstream reflects me. Uh, and so also the community that I grew up in was very uh, like a, a collective community and not an individualistic community like the US. And what I found is that there's this sense of uh, unsafety within my body in systems like that. Uh, and now living here, I'm doing a lot of work on trauma and like how to be in relation with each other and be able to, I don't know, uh, deal with conflict. Uh, what I find is that whenever we give feedback to other people, it's usually a reflection of our experience of life. And we're not always aware of it. Like there's a certain projection and like looking through a lens that is not objective, that we're not aware of. So when I hear about like, communities where we have feedback in this kind of way, especially like something about like tomorrow, like when you want to have kids, you have the community talk about stuff. It makes me uneasy. How do you account for the fact that we have shadows, we have repressed selves, we have lenses that we look through that we're not always aware of. And we might think that we're coming from objective truth, uh, but we might be imposing something on other people especially if those others are not people whose reality is mainstream in a way that we can relate to and understand. Mm. Mm. Great question. Thank you yeah. for that question. Yeah, that's a really good one. I can, I have, do you want to? I have some thoughts too on, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could I take this first? Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, go for it. I mean, I think what just comes to me is that, I mean, great question in that sense that you, you kind of have to sense where the feedback's coming from when you, when you are in this. I'll just give an example of Tamara and also what we've done in our communities here, which is through a practice called Forum, which of course, if you've seen The Village of Lovers, the film, it's basically a, a facilitated practice where the community comes together. And one of the, the key areas of that practice is giving mirrors, as they're called, right after somebody goes in and kind of performs what, what they're going through. Um, and it's it's well known sort of within that community that if somebody's giving a mirror that they're, they call it being identified with, so it's very clear that it's like their stuff coming up and in what they're sharing, or if the community is kind of like, mm, that doesn't feel clean. They didn't even say that. It doesn't feel like a clean mirror. It feels like your own stuff coming out. They'll be caught in that. And, you know, that takes a kind of higher degree of awareness and also a continued willingness to, to each person to be subject to feedback loops. So you begin to be checked, you know, in your own biases, um, rather than only sampling from like a very narrow uh, amount of, of perspectives, right? So 
I'll just say, yeah, that's kind of like the overall cohesiveness and intelligence of the group's awareness to come to that. And if you don't kind of have that level of, of that self-awareness, you have to kind of, yeah, you have to sort of sample from a variety of sources in order to get a more of a holistic picture. I'll just say that piece. It sounds like John wants to share. Yeah. And just building on, on that, I think that the necessity is to have a wider community group. If it just is like, we're having this one person or having a leader give us feedback, right? That's how you often get into these abusive power guru uh, dynamics in that there's something about like a feedback loop kind of being almost like this trade blanket where people put it down and it is kind of like you get to choose how much you take it or like leave it and that the safety in it is that there are other people. So if I'm really triggered by something Ian said, because maybe I'm jealous or I have my own biases, if eight other people feedback differently, it's going to bring a lot of questions to the way that I chose the feedback or other people even better will likely just say, kind of what Ian's saying, they'll be like, hey, John, check in with yourself. You feel like you're triggered right now or it feels like that might be coming from somewhere else. So I think it's in that capacity for the feedback loop to keep going that it doesn't just stop in one place, but there's other vectors for the feedback to keep orienting it. And I'd say ultimately feedback loops aren't just about like, let's figure out the truth. But even if somebody says something and they're triggered and it makes me triggered or it, that's just all good data to keep surfacing like a learning journey, which I'd say is more the purpose than necessarily getting to one stable truth ever. What's the thing to do in any one moment? It's like, how do we keep revealing and seeing that we are all aspects of each other? So even my issue that's getting feedback is a collective issue. And there, that's like, it's like, that gets into a whole different orientation that uh, Tamira holds and we will explore, explore more in, in the, in the course, but it is in that sense of like, how do feedback loops keep moving? That creates a flow. We're talking about with the water that doesn't get anywhere stagnant. If somebody is coming from a, less integrated place. Okay, thank you. I wish we had like yeah. 20 minutes for each of these questions, but we're gonna go on to, I saw so Justin's much. hand next and thank you, Queen Bee, that was a great question. I would love to, we'll think about these and maybe add resources in our follow-up email too, with any thoughts. Okay, Justin, what is your question? Oh, oh sorry, go ahead again, Justin. I, I hit you on mute and you muted, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, sorry, I had to take an important call. So if you talked about this already, I apologize. Um, but uh, yeah, and I just want to say I'm really bad at public speaking. So nervous. Oh, good. Um, yeah, no but way. yeah, I, I was heartened to know that you guys were talking about um, children so much and that family group. And I'm just wondering if, because you talk about this social ecosystem, um, if you're aware of Darsha Narvai's work on uh, the evolved developmental niche, because she's, she's, from what I pick up from her work, it's, it's a similar thing where you're trying to cultivate this environment, um, but it's more based around uh, mothers and children and um, just kind of uh, attachment theory. I know John Bowlby, I think, was the first one to, I don't know. If he... Sorry, Adam. Oh. Keep going. We lost it, Justin. It looks like you muted again for some reason. Yeah, sorry. There you go. Um, yeah, John Bowlby was talking about the environment of evolutionary adaptation. And Darsha's work is kind of similar to, to that. So it's it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like. What would your question be, Justin? Can you can you just like, what's the question that you have? Oh, you muted yourself again. Yeah. How's that? Should be able to unmute. Oh, looks like I might have lost you. Maybe we go on to Rena. I see Rena's hand up. And Justin, maybe you okay. can type your question in the chat. Okay, great. Oh, oh, there we go. Hi, Rena. You should be able to unmute now. Yeah. Oh, can you do it again? Yep. You should get a little thing that says uh, you can unmute. 
on your might be tricky on your phone though. Um, you. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was about to bring my head down because I was. It was not an. Uh, it's no. It was not a question. I want to uh, talk about the importance of mirror. And and earlier it was talk. You know, we're talking about polyamory is a is a chance to care for each other. Each other. And I remember in practicing a kind of gr in group loving that the women and the men would would uh, sit separately for the women to um to speak what's on their heart and it's it's really beautiful to see a, like a married woman who says hey sisters you can support me this time by treating my husband this way or that uh, we're going through a, you know a delicate time so please i would love to spend time with him alone and not to share this month and i love how the sisters supported each other and my point is you know polyamory is like a heart like you know we what we need and and how we can meet each other's needs is a constant flow and thank you for reminding me of uh how polyamory is about really the vulnerability and the support we can give each other and i'm very inspired by this talk mm. thanks Rena. yeah beautiful thank you Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we're pretty close to time, but um, yeah, Julie was thinking to take one more. Again, folks can bring these questions also to the school um, where they can, you know, we can have more space to to respond to each in detail. But yeah, maybe yeah. Julie, do you want to pick the last <laughs> one? Um, well, we have questions that we can answer in the follow-up email, like resources for learning forum, or how can you find a trust group? Um, I perceive Tamara as a field with high avoidance attachment style. Uh, how do you perceive that? Um, how does economic hardship come into play, especially transient or homeless living as a direct need for community, but not resources for stability? How do you avoid linear evolution expectations? I'm not sure what linear evolution means, but. Um... I feel like I could respond to that. Okay. I mean, I think, yeah, in terms of economic hardship, I mean, I mean, you mentioned uh, in terms of homeless population as well, but really though, the the economic structures that we have now and the concentration of wealth are a huge issue to actually move into shared uh, economic paradigm where like, because if you have a hierarchy of who owns and who doesn't, uh, who has access to purchase property or who doesn't, um, it's a massive thing. And a lot of that is also, of course, from legacy of colonialism or wealth that's passed down from parent to child and other folks who don't have those advantages can't buy in. And so these are real questions that lots of other great thinkers are figuring out. Um, I think that there has to be some threshold reached where a group, if a group truly wants to transcend though into uh, a deep shared village uh, mindedness versus just a community that kind of does things, you know, occasionally together, they actually have to really uh, work on the economic side of things and figure out actually how to uh, become more interdependent economically, which could mean that some folks with more abundance are actually um, willing to bequeath to also support those who don't have initial access, but there's different you know equity that can be generated. But that's like a broader, uh, cha massive challenge actually with moving into these communal structures. And then in terms of homeless populations and things, I, I wouldn't say I have as much to say on that other than that, yes, structural support largely through um, broader social programs um, is absolutely still vital, of course, because a lot of these people need a certain degree of massive healing and uh, support that to just simply embed them within a community can be very challenging, of course, because a lot of communities aren't equipped to uphold like really deep um, trauma and, and substance abuse and things like that. So it is a real um, conundrum, but we do need all of these ways to help navigate the transition of the times. Um, yeah, anything last before you want to close for now, guys? Um, I just I see Ansem there. Maybe just I'd love to hear you, uh, Ansem, briefly, then we'll uh, wrap it up. And that will be our last uh, question, folks. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, I would love to die and say we would love to dialogue uh, further. So please do bring your questions to our school or on the Facebook because I'd love to go in there and just be in conversation with all of you. Um, and John, can you can you drop in the link for the school? Yeah, in the I, 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 yeah. I will do that. Yeah, we're not sure. Yes, uh, I have a short question. 
uh, some of the comments mentioned here that, that this like difference of contact and uh, contact improve or, or biodanza in a way for to like come into truth with this with, with ourself and and others and and uh, I think this embodiment is a very different embodiment thing as um, uh, techniques are very important how how do you when you have an online community and want to practice like these things in an online community, how to bring this embodiment into into the work? Yeah, I can I can say that. This to say that you no, know, we've been iterating that the last four or five years. I think all of us have during you know COVID and post COVID times, and that I think we're as a species really figuring out what's the best way to really use technology. And again, it's not creating a binary of like tech is bad or tech is good. And you know, many people are in the camp, tech's going to save us. And I think what we're seeing is that like one, how do we bring embodiment when we're meeting in like community for doing council or forum, which I know many um, communities that are existing, doing deeper sharing and really building intimacy. And I think even beyond that, though, what we're seeing is that we're building, for instance, a global network and we're building spaces of co-learning. But even in the course we're running this summer, we do feel it's going to be imperative that we are empowering people to build community in their local spaces in person that is weaving and being fed by the greater relational ecology of the online world and the online uh, communities and networks that we're like building. And I think we're trying to find a way that this web can really like weave. How can we use these technologies of Zoom and the internet and our Facebook groups to really be a wider, broader ecosystem that can really support local ecologies wherever they are at and how do those feed in and out? So that's kind of the best that we've uh, come up with. We don't think it can fully happen online. And there are ways to really increase the online um, experience. But I think it should be almost like we come back online to share and like share notes and grow and like support so that we can be weaving community wherever we're at, even if we're traveling and uh, on the move. And I know it's not a okay. fully complete uh, answer, but yeah, come to our school and we'll dive in more. Well, I think we are just to touch over the initial time we slotted and um, this could be the moment now to wrap. Any any sort of few words before it, Julia? Yeah, just, there's a um yeah, there's just a question in the chat from Nova. Is the summer of love primarily white hetero focused? And I just want to say no, despite the fact that we three filmmakers are white. Um, as someone who identifies as bisexual, I am also very deeply influenced by um, black queer feminist thinking, and I really want to bring in that lens as well. We've got a number of guest teachers we're going to bring on. We want to bring in dialogue. If you want to write to us, I know some people have brought in references of what has informed your path and your body of knowledge. Please share that. We want to be in dialogue. We want to be in a dynamic learning space together. Um, and I think that it's wonderful to ask whatever questions maybe maybe keeping you from fully um, fully receiving the information, fully engaging, and that this is a dynamic body of work and we are constantly evolving our understanding. So thank you for um, engaging and being with us um, despite all that and in light of all that. Also to offer uh, gratitude again for yeah, your time today. And um, this recording will be made available. You'll get an email uh, if you're of course registered online and um, it would help us as well if you'd be willing to share this with other members in your community um, posted online as a way of also, again, offering this perspective, different perspectives around this conversation that can help spread a mutual awareness. So you at least have a certain coherence, right? In, in being able to wade into these conversations. And last, last thing I'll share is that, you know, as we're building towards doing this online cohort this summer, we're offering discounts to people to take it in groups. Like my vision is that people take it in groups. And that could be a group in your local area that's wanting to go deeper, a group of friends you can take it with your partner, your parents. But it could also be that through our school, through this kind of uh, container, some of you here team up to be like a learning pod. We're actually going to be also broken down into like learning pods. 
But if people in our wider network want to team up, you can then come in on a discount and really have a more nested container to like learn. So it's again, it's part of this how we culturally iterate how we're really building communities, at least this point of like learning at this time. So we just want to uh, invite you to that space. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your time. Thank yeah. you, all the forces. And maybe we just us. name maybe we just named that there are public Facebook groups. Um, maybe Ian, can you drop the link to some people would like to continue the dialogue there for certain of topics here? And that's maybe a place to also connect about this idea of potting up. Um, so yeah, we mm -hmm. have the online school, we have the online Facebook group for Village of Lovers. Um, you have our email contact at reculturemedia.com if there is a wish to directly write to us with your questions. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in today, making space for this. Um, and we look forward to continuing the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks everyone.